welcome to Young at Heart. I'm Tammy Murray, the Director of Elder Affairs for the Town of Kingston. And today I'm joined by the Fire Chief, Bob Heath. Thank you for coming on today. You're welcome, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, and actually the reason that I wanted to have him on the show today was to get in front of something that I've been seeing a lot more of in town as far as um, issues with people who are over 60 or disabled who live alone and um, often run into problems. Um, usually by the time the chief calls me, it's already in a crisis. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about how we can better prepare for things before the crisis happens to help more people in the community. Okay. Um, basically, and, I'm, and it's not a secret to anyone, we talk frequently when it comes to snowstorms or people who are in need. Um, a lot of times I'll be the one that calls Old Colony Elder Services, but of course you and the police department can also contact them. Right. Um, but what I kind of want to get across to people is how, if we get in front of a situation, those drastic steps sometimes don't have to happen. That's correct, Tammy. One of the things though that, that should be pointed out to people is around this time of year, each year you give me an updated list of all the seniors in town and what we do is we keep that in our database too um, and that's very important so that we can we can tag you know a certain area of people that might need help now getting out in front of something like that through our inspection process or through just being out on the street a lot we recognize differences we see things uh, my officers and firefighters will come back to me and and they'll write something in a report, which I review each re run report on a daily basis. But they'll, they'll mention stuff to me of, hey, you know, Chief, maybe we need to call um, Council on Aging to deal with this person. Maybe we need to check on, on this sort of a situation. And that's very helpful. That, that helps us get out on, in front of a lot of stuff, too. Yep, and I know sometimes you might not notice the stuff that you have in your home that might be something that sparks an interest, such as mattresses near the furnace or big piles of paper near a power strip that's plugged into an extension right. cord that's in the other room, right. and you're in a wheelchair, um, things like that. <laughs> the, yeah, that's, that's correct. And, you know, what folks don't realize is that residential homes are different than businesses. See, businesses, we're mandated quarterly to go out and inspect just like doing fire drills in municipal buildings, doing mm -hmm. fire drills in schools. We're, we're mandated by law to do certain things. But a person's home, we can't just come in and knock on the door and say, we're here to do an inspection of your home because that's, you know, that's your private dwelling. Um, we certainly would invite people to, the, if they wanted us to come down and do a safety inspection, we'd be more than happy to come down and, and show them any changes they need to make or something like that. And by all means, we wouldn't, we wouldn't write them up right. or find them <laughs> or, or something like that. But, you know, that might be a preemptive step, um, you know, also. Yeah, and I think that's something that people get hung up on, too, is if they reach out for something like an inspection or if they call me concerned about a neighbor that it absolutely means there's going to be fines involved or follow-up calls or all that kind of thing no where no not the case we what we'd rather do is work with you to make it so people can stay in their homes make it so they have a safe environment make it so that they have the proper smoke detectors the carbon monoxide detectors a way out mm -hmm. a second way out um and you know to check on their well-being and that just reminded me of something. Um, at one of my other jobs, there was a fire that was started on somebody's couch. They had lit a match and a spark flew off. And when we got there to get the person out of the house, they were like dropping cups of water onto the couch, trying to put the fire out. They didn't know where their exit was. And that's a huge concern when you're talking about fire and smoke and that kind of thing. Yes, um, and a number of reasons. Um, one of which is, is you're not trained to be a firefighter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, and you don't have the protective clothing that we have. Um, you're going to be breathing in smoke, the byproducts of a fire which is contained in the smoke, carbon monoxide. You're going to get this stuff into you and what it does in a very, very short period of time is it changes your mentation. Mm -hmm. It changes your level of consciousness. You will become disoriented. You won't be able to see. First thing everybody does is stand up. Well, that's where all the heat and the gases are. You stand up, you breathe in that, you're gonna burn your mouth, your, your, uh, your airway, your, your air passages, 
And you're also going to be so disoriented, you're not going to find your way up. So you know, that's where we come in, and we end up dragging somebody out. But we want to prevent that. You know, so there's certain things that you can do, of mm -hmm. course. Um, if there's a fire, call 911 right away. If you have to call 911 from the outside, that's the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. But make sure everybody gets outside. And, and then let us put the fire up. Right. You know, right. Yeah. So, <laughs> it was uh, ineffective watching cups of water. <laughs> well, not only is it ineffective, but if the fire grows, you've now delayed it. And, mm -hmm. the, and the damage to someone's home will be far worse. And that will delay the time that they can get back into the home. Right. So. And there we were talking, and I always forget the name of the program, but you have a program where you're able to pass out a certain number of smoke detectors to people? Yes, it's called the Senior Smokes. Um, it was instituted by Chief Albergini years and years ago. Um, and what, what the program entails is we have smoke detectors and a, a limited amount of carbon monoxide detectors. Mm -hmm. They come to us from a manufacturer called Kitta. And the smoke detectors are directly from the company. We have uh, a fire prevention fund that we get, get that through each year. But we also have the carbon monoxide detectors that come to us through basically the efforts of what Senator Murray did. Mm -hmm. um, so we get those, those annually. And the way the program works is, is a senior will call us. Their batteries need to be changed or the detector is older than 10 years old, then mm -hmm. we'll get replaced. It's not a blanket, we'll replace every detector in your home, but we'll provide you with at least one working smoke detector and one working carbon monoxide detector free of charge. That's a really so, great program. <laughs> and, it, and it works. And yeah. we've had situations where that detector, now working, has actually gone off when there's been an incident at someone's home. Mm -hmm. So. Which is so important, especially yeah. with carbon monoxide. Um, Correct. And I think, you know, with the winter months coming, um, and even in the summer watching your neighbors, but if you live in a community where your elderly neighbor might have one of the new furnaces that the pipe is like only six feet off the ground and there's big snow banks and Correct. it's good to get all that pulled well, away. Or um, it's very important that gas furnaces, as well as any other combustion furnace, has a, an area to have both clean air intake to burn efficiently, mm -hmm. but also to be able to vent out the fumes. Now there's a lot of homes now that have a power vent system, which is be outside your house, it's about like this, and it's, it's the venting system. That has to be cleared of snow also, because when these vents are blocked, it backs up all the fumes into the house. And hopefully you have a CO detector, which is gonna make it go off, but if it doesn't, they call carbon monoxide the silent killer, and mm -hmm. it will kill you. Yeah, I, I know we just replaced our burner a couple of years ago, and now the vents are on the side of the house, never mind the fact that they're really ugly. Yes. <laughs> but yep. I'm constantly watching them, and I just think sometimes, like, you know, with mass saves, they have those programs where you get rebates. A lot of older couples or people are replacing their burners, and they might not fully understand what's being put into the right. house. Well, in, in Massachusetts, the beauty of that is, is we have an inspection process for oil burners and um, gas-fired burners. Mm -hmm. The gas-fired burners are done by the gas inspector. Well, we do the oil burners. Okay. So we're looking for these things, and if they don't make code, what we do is we shut them down, we mm -hmm. red tag them, and we pull the fire matic switch from up above, and unfortunately you can't be warm until <laughs> it gets re-inspected uh, right. or, or gets the, the problems fixed. So I didn't know about that, see? Yeah. This is great. Yeah. So, <laughs> so. So um, just getting back to some of the, the phone calls that we, and without being specific, that you might come across where you're called out to somebody's home and mm -hmm. you find out that um, the neighbors knew that there was an odor coming from the home or that the person was a hoarder or that, you know, what can yep. we encourage the community to look out for or do so that we can all work together to make sure that these don't get to a level where people are losing their homes or can't go back into their homes, that kind right. of thing. It's kind of a downside effect to the way our world has changed. Mm -hmm. People keep to themselves. People don't want to bother the neighbor. People don't want to get involved with other people. Our town's a very small, close-knit community. Mm -hmm. okay. um, we've got between 12 and 13,000 people, depending on whose census you read. Um, 
but folks should look at some telltale signs. Overgrown out, outside front yard. It's not mowed, um, you know, that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. people know their neighbors. Uh, if, and someone has the right to privacy, mm -hmm. absolutely. A person could be a very private person. But if the neighbors would just keep an eye out, see the person, give us a call. You know, if they see somebody that just goes out and then comes back into the house, they, they really don't know what's going on in there, but they're concerned because they think the neighbor might need help in one way or another, mm -hmm. give a call. Um, they can call us, they can call the police, they can call you. We can go out there and just knock on the door, say, hey, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, which, which really is not a problem, um, day or night. You're not bothering us. Right. We want to help people. Um, and maybe we could, you know, just offer them some tips to, to help them. Um, folks do like to keep a hold of things. Yes. They like to <laughs> just kind of, young and old, yep. they, they do like to hold on to things that they've bought over the years. They do like to, to hold on to, to different things and they like to stack things up. Um, my biggest concern with that is it becomes a fire hazard in someone's home. Mm -hmm. The next biggest concern is, is if a person has little pathways that will have a tendency to occur, how can you get out safely? And right. do you have your doors blocked? And you know, do you have a, a, a way to get out? We can help you with things like that. You know, we, we can contact your mm -hmm. office. We can get volunteers. We can get friends, neighbors, family to come and, and help just to make it so that their home is livable so that they can stay in their home. We don't want to screw up their life, so to right. speak. We don't, <laughs> we don't want to change their patents. We don't want to be big brother watching over you. Mm -hmm. We want to preempt that and we want to make it so that you can stay in your home. You, you can, you, you know, you can have friends. You can have people come and be there to help you. Right. And I know when I was working in housing, something that it really, I mean, it must have crossed my mind at some point, but it didn't always stay in my head, was having that clear pathway to a bedroom so that if you do have to come in with a stretcher that you can get somebody out of their bedroom. And I mean, I'm not going to lie, sometimes my hallway's full of laundry or I have an mm -hmm. animal cage out there or, yep. you know, just thinking it's going to stay there for a week. And then a month goes by, and then, then there's a rabbit in the hallway. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's things yeah. like that that you, I never really kept in the forefront until I worked in housing and I was doing those types of inspections. Right. Well, you have to live, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we know during our day-to-day -day lives <laughs> that things just get busy and things pile up. But anyway, um, yes, that's true about having to get the stretcher in. God forbid we have to, mm -hmm. you know come in and, and take you out for a medical emergency. But to back up a little bit, all of that stuff out there can be a trip hazard, mm -hmm. which can lead you to that issue. Right. Now, if someone um, smokes, which I don't pass judgment on, mm -hmm. that's fine, that's, that's a choice you make. Um, if someone smokes and you have a lot of stuff piled up in hallways and so when you're walking around with ashes and so forth, it can cause a fire, believe it or not. Everybody yeah. will say, oh, no, no, by the time it hits the ground. Like, no, it can smolder, just like in a, in a couch. Yeah. It could smolder for days and all of a sudden catch some, some air and start. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's important that you kind of keep an eye on where things get stacked, mostly because you don't want to trip and fall over it. Right. <laughs> so. Um, that brings up something else. I had recently had a conversation with someone about oxygen. Mm -hmm. Now, they, I understood that, you know, if you're in the house with oxygen and you smoke, you, well, you probably shouldn't, but, you know, the oxygen can set on fire. But I didn't realize that the oxygen can also be in your clothing. So then if you walk outside to smoke, yes. is that true? Like, yes. I caught Statical, half of a conversation. Static electricity. Um, walking across a rug, mm -hmm. um, shimmying across a couch, or, you know. Um, we've had instances like that where we've had people hurt very, very badly um, that they had their nasal cannula in flowing a couple mm -hmm. of liters of oxygen and decided to take a cigarette break and, you know, you're in an oxygen enriched, enriched atmosphere similar to a, a, a space capsule. Mm -hmm. And anyone that 
remembers the first Apollo mission with the three astronauts killed, it was a new oxygen-enriched atmosphere. They had a spark, a fire, and it burns very, very intensely. And you will get hurt, if not worse. So, yeah, the other thing with the oxygen is, is folks will have the oxygen machine in one spot and 40 feet of tubing right. that goes around and around. It goes everywhere, which is great because it makes you mobile. Mm -hmm. The problem is you've got to watch where that tubing is so that you don't trip and fall over that or that it doesn't come undone. And wherever you go, it's going to follow you. Mm -hmm. So. And then um, the other thing that I think is really important, in my internship I do a lot of home visits and a lot of people can't leave their homes. And very few of them have like a lifeline or a life alert button or something to press so that if they do fall down, yep. it's encouraged, we should encourage people to get those as well or do Absolutely. they? Absolutely. Um, their doctors would, office would be able to steer them in the right direction mm -hmm. with that. Um, and typically that's where it it comes from. Not only that, but any paperwork such as medicines they're taking, their health conditions, um, you know, do they have a, uh, a comfort care piece of paperwork. Mm -hmm. And this is all private stuff, but they should be dealing with this through their doctor. And when we get there, we call it a refrigerator card. Yep. We have them. If they need them, we'll get them to them. Um, but they keep that on their refrigerator. And when my firefighters and paramedics come to the scene, they'll grab that. It's got all the information and they take it right with the patient. I was so. going to ask that too, and I keep forgetting my questions. I should write them down. Um, I recently went to um, a showing of Being Mortal. It was a movie that was on Channel 2 about a doctor who um, really didn't think about end-of-life care until it really started coming out of me. He works at Dana-Farber. Mm -hmm. And they talked about the most, and they talked about DNRs and things like that. And they do say, put it on your refrigerator. So my question was going to be, do people actually put them on the refrigerator, and are your guys trained to go yes. right to the refrigerator? Oh, yeah. And yep. does it have to be on a certain color paper or in a certain envelope? We have or? big yellow cards okay. that they can put their medical conditions, their, their uh, next of kin to notify, um, their medications, their uh, allergies, anything special. Um, mm -hmm. If you know, One of the things that we look for is if, if you have someone that has an animal, mm -hmm. that's their family. They, they don't have kids with them anymore. Right. That's their family. That's their loved ones. If they get taken out by ambulance for a medical emergency, what do we do with their loved one? Mm -hmm. Well, we can call animal control. We'd like to be able to call a family member if possible. That's the best bet. Yeah. But um, we can make those notifications and, and get make sure that their animal is taken care of. You know, and, that's, and, that's a good point. You I, know, oh yes, we run into. <laughs> I have a lot of animals. Uh, I don't know where you'd bring my turtles, but <laughs> I guess I'll put it on a yellow card on my fridge. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to talk with the animal control yeah. office to see if they'll take turtles. But, uh, that is a huge. That's a really good yeah. point. Like, what do you do with it? Cause, and that puts their mind at ease. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, it already starts stabilizing one component of their medical emergency. Right. Their stress. Yeah. So, you know, even though they might have a fractured hip or, or trouble breathing, we're taking care of another, um, another component of their stress for that medical emergency by, okay, someone's on their way to take care of your pet, be it a family member, yeah. a neighbor, mm -hmm. or, you know, or animal, animal control. control. Yeah. And they, you know that they'll be looked over because our animal control people are phenomenal. They really are. Yeah. yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll really watch over them uh, until you get out of the hospital or come home and, and then you can pick them up or have them delivered back. Yeah. You know, so. And then on that same vein, um, when your guys and the paramedics go into a home and if somebody's non-responsive, they're, they're trained to bring that person back. So if it's something that you don't want, then it definitely should be on the fridge, right? Like Ab how does, absolutely. How does that they, work in real life, I guess? Well, what, what has to occur is you have to make the decision with your primary care physician, mm -hmm. your health care proxy your family, you have to communicate it. Because we've had instances where we go in and someone has their wishes in writing and signed yeah. and the family members get into the oh no panic mode. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it's very, very hard letting go. Right. It, it really is and I, and I sympathize with them. But the patient's wishes are there and they have to be of sound mind to sign all of this. Mm -hmm. Their doctor makes sure of that. And, and we get the wishes of the family, and then it becomes a controversy. Right. And, and in the meantime, 
you know, we're calling medical control, but we're working on the patient. Mm -hmm. You know, at that point in time, you know, you've got to you've got to go ahead and 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 work the patient until you can get it squared away with our medical control doctor at the hospital. Um, the best bet is to start at their primary care physician. Yeah, get everything in place, then they can make the notifications to us. Yeah, and we are um, going to be focusing on that a lot more. And it, it was interesting because I learned of someone recently who had said to a couple people, you know, if something happens to me, I don't, you know, want to be intubated. I don't want this. I don't want that. Um, a medical emergency occurred. They got all of this intervention, and they're running around fine today. So it's where it's such a hard decision. We are going right. to be focusing more on it just right. to have information out there for those reasons. Because I, yep. I know a lot of people in town. Their kids live in other states or other cities, or you know, they're two hours away, and it's right. better to know what their wishes are before something like that happens. So that is something we're gonna be focusing a lot more on, Correct. as well as getting the community involved and watching out for each other again, because right. I think Kingston's really strong when it comes to that. Right, and, and that's important. That, like I said before, if, if you see a neighbor that you think might need a helping hand, mm -hmm. knock on the door. If they tell you to go away, go then, away. <laughs> well, yeah, go away. But make a make a call to either mm -hmm. your office yep. if they're a, a person that's elderly, or make a call to to us. Mm -hmm. um, we can come out and do a well-being check. Right. And you know, if if a person is is cognitive cognitive enough that they can answer the appropriate questions, if they look like they're fine and so forth. We're just going to say goodbye and, and, and leave if there is no medical emergency. But we've checked. Right. We, we now know that that person's on the radar. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, like you said, we communicate. Right, right. So you'll know on the same, the same level that we do. Yeah. So, you know, it's, and, and we can keep reaching out to these people. Yeah, and I think that goes along with what <coughs> Colony always says when it comes to the protective services or elder at risk calls that we make. Call anyway. If it's mm -hmm. not one, that's great. You yep. know, have a party that they're not at risk. But yeah, exactly, don't overlook it, thinking you're yep. overstepping your bounds. Yep. Um, and I know old colony, they're they're very busy, so we like to screen things ahead of time. But a lot yep. of times, it's just that phone call that's going to make the difference to somebody. That's right. And we do have a lot of people in town, like over the age of ninety, that live alone. Oh, yeah. Which I was shocked to learn as I got more into the job and I'm and, able to focus more on that piece. Yeah. And some of them might be better off than those that are 30 that yeah. live alone. <laughs> it's true. You know, really. Yeah. But, it is really true. Uh, there's a reason they got to be that age. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I know. But yeah, they, the, the population is definitely growing older. Mm -hmm. um, and they're able to stay in their homes. Right. So, you know, and our goal is not to take them out, you know, and just keep keep them in their home as long as possible. Yeah, and that was the other thing I was going to say about the list sharing that we do in particular, that everything, even if somebody were to call us, is kept confidential. Absolutely. We're not going to say, oh, your neighbor Mary just called and yep. said that you were having trouble. You know, it's always confidential. It's yep. kept between us. We both abide by HIPAA, so that's yep. Absolutely. really important. Absolutely. Um, and also with HIPAA, we can share certain yep. information. Yep. So. Yeah, that's true. <coughs> I, I had to get certified for that in school, so it's like... Sometimes people use HIPAA, and I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> but it is true. It, I mean, and I, being the director, fall under that purview. My staff doesn't always. It depends on the situation. So right. I know it was huge when I first got there, and I was like, oh, no, you can't tell this person what happened to that person here yesterday, you yeah. know, unless the person allows you to you do so. You probably shouldn't be anyway. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. it. Um, it was a slippery slope because people didn't understand because in, in that kind of facility, it's kind of like a close-knit group. Right. You know, so they might have known this person for 20 years, and here I was coming in saying, oh, no, I can't share with you what happened. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. so it's, yeah. um, that part's been a challenge. But I think it's important for people to know that if they come to us that that information isn't going to go anywhere. Absolutely. And if you come for, inform or for a free fire detector or yep. an inspection on your heating system or whatever it is that that information no one, stays No there. one knows that information. Mm -hmm. You know, you just call up, we take your information, and we come out and take care of the problem. Yeah. And that's the so, same with all your guys, do the yep, same thing. Absolutely. I know, um, and, and I hope I don't get anybody in trouble. Uh, a few years ago, uh, my mom had had surgery, mm -hmm. and I picked her up, and I was shocked that they let her leave the place in the condition she was. She wasn't hardly awake at that point, and it was her knees. And we got to the house, and I couldn't get her in. 
and I'm in my driveway with an office chair. I put my mother on it. I can't pick her up. And I'm like, what do I do? I'm like crying in the driveway. I'm calling on my friends, come, come. So I ended up calling and luckily no one was busy because three guys came over and they wrapped her up in a blanket and they carried her into the house. And it was like the most amazing thing ever yep. because I really didn't think when I called that that was something that would be able to be done. And of course, well, if they were busy, it wouldn't have been. But Right, but, it was, well, if they were busy, we'd have gotten some help in yeah. to help you. We have a recall system and so forth. So, but, but yeah, we. It, if what you feel you have is an emergency, give us a call and we'll take it from there. It might not be an emergency in our eyes, but in your eyes, it's an emergency. Mm -hmm. So, you know. That's great. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, we're running out of time, unfortunately. I've loved this conversation. Yeah. Um, I, I hope we can continue to have these check-ins and you can come on my show whenever you want. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Maybe you'll get your own show. I know you don't want it. But, um, but again, if you, if you have any questions about somebody's health or you have any concerns about someone, reach out to one of us because we're all here to help each other and work together. And I thank you all for joining us again on Young at Heart and we'll see you next time. Thanks.